Good. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure for, for me to be here. And um, I was given a, a free hand as to what to talk about. So um, I could indeed have said something specifically about uh, St. John Henry, but um, as time moved on, I thought what I really wanted to talk about was another project that I'm involved with all the time, and that is um, a project to do with singing the Mass, and specifically to do with singing the Prophets of the Mass, but that's what I'm going to talk about as we move on. I've decided to call this um, out of the ordinary because, well, partly because it's singing about other than the ordinary of the Mass, but it's also thing, singing about thinking about singing those parts of the Mass which are not often sung anyway. So it's something that is extraordinary, by which I don't mean the extraordinary form of the Mass, because in fact the project that I've been working on for the last, well, I suppose about 10 years, more or less, and it's still ongoing, is really to do with singing the, 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 the ordinary form of the Mass. But it does involve singing the ordinary form of the Mass in more than just Latin, because it's also in English. So the project that I've been working on, in, in fact, is a kind of parallel existence of Latin and English texts set to um, music and to specifically to Gregorian chant. But let me not say too much before moving on to the, the body of the subject. So, starting to say with with, um, with out of the ordinary, um, I want to to introduce you. I don't know if you'll be able to see an, an awful lot of this. Maybe it's going a bit too small, uh, but I'll read bits out as we go through, so that you won't be entirely deprived of the, the wisdom that's that's been projected on the screen for you. Um, it is wisdom because it's not from me; it's from Holy Mother Church. So there we are. So first of all, the, the whole project that I've been, been immersed in, apart from my other studies, is to do with the, 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 the nature of singing the Mass as such. Um, everybody, of course, is used to the idea of singing at Mass. Um, that's something which I think we do quite a lot. But what I'm particularly in, interested in trying to convey to everybody is the idea of seeing the mass itself. Um, so it's not just the question of having a bit of singing here, which you just sort of drop in to the mass, like singing hymns at the beginning and singing hymn at the offertory and the communion at the end. The what was often been quite irreverently, but nonetheless, I think, quite accurately called the hymn sandwich. It's my idea of, of singing is quite distinct from that. It's not just singing during the Mass, but singing the actual Mass itself, which is not something, on the whole, that one hears very often. Certainly not in the ordinary uh, parochial form of liturgy. But that's precisely what I'm trying to uh, bring to mind tonight to put before you as a prospect that you might wish to adopt and extend, because I, I want to help you to, to understand what I've appreciated, which is the great spiritual benefit of singing the Mass itself. So it's not just an aesthetic experience, though there is that, of course, about it, but a spiritual one above all else. Um, and it's not just singing during Mass, and not just singing little bits here and there at Mass, like, say, the Responsorial Psalm, or the Alleluia, or the Doxology at the end of the canon, or whatever. It's actually about singing much more than simply those. And for that, I say that the, the great encouragement comes from Holy Mother Church. Um, so there's a, there's a bit there in green, which um, uh, is, is the, the, the first of those texts, which comes from Sancta Virgilium, which was the very first of the documents that was published in the Second Vatican Council back in 1963. So the very first thing that the bishops meeting together in council 
decided to discuss and to, to promulgate an apostolic constitution on was the liturgy. And one of the things they said about the liturgy, which is very important, is about music. One of the things they find is, the musical tradition of the universal church is a treasure of inestimable value, greater even than that of any other art. Well worth while, while bearing that in mind. Because obviously we think of art and architecture, the visual arts and the plastic arts have been very important, but the Council Father said this, the musical tradition of the church is a treasure that is of greater estimate, estimability than any of the others. And the main reason for this preeminence is that as a combination of sacred music and words, it forms an integral part of the solemn liturgy. It's so it's that combination of sacred music and words and the integral nature of it with the liturgy that is so important that the Council Fathers recognised and wished to promote as well. So it wasn't just simply a question of saying, well, you have on the one hand the solemn mass, the high mass, and then you have the low mass. And that kind of distinction, which was very much the, the norm before the Council, and in many ways has continued to exercise um, an influence on the way that the liturgy is celebrated even to this day. Low mass, high mass, mass with singing, mass without singing. What the Council Fathers wanted to try and convey was there is a possibility which is worth pursuing of singing more than just only the most solemn form of the mass and only singing bits of the mass. Sing what you can, not just only when you can sing the whole of the Mass. So that was a very important idea, but also to, to try and encourage the singing of more of the Mass. And of course, along with that was the whole idea that this isn't just something for choirs to do, this is something that actually involves also the sacred ministers and congregations as well. So that it wasn't just a question of having an entirely passive congregation while everybody else on the sanctuary and in the choir loft got on with the singing, but was also an, in, an, an intention to encourage the congregations as well. And also where there wasn't necessarily a very competent choir, you could use the means at your disposal. So not just simply a question of having trained singers, or even of you know, willing volunteers of a certain standard, but also that the congregations themselves could be encouraged to do more than just sing the most basic chants. And so this is where what I'm talking about tonight comes in. It's to do more than just the basic minimum. Um, so apart from the Sacrosanct Lucilian, then there's also the, the general instruction of the Missal, which you find at the beginning of the Missal, which has got some very uh, interesting and important uh, instructions for the whole of, of the um, celebration of liturgy and it says there that liturgical worship is given a more noble form when the divine offices are celebrated solemnly in song um, when it is stated that great importance should be attached to the use of singing in the celebration of mass and every care should be taken that singing by the ministers and the people not to be absent in celebrations that occur on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. So particularly, of course, on the most solemn days, but it should not just be a question of choirs, but also of congregations as well, given every encouragement. So going back up to the, 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 the top uh, bullet points again, that's why the church encourages singing, because it ends as more solemn form and raises the whole kind of um, the whole level of the spiritual expressiveness of the Mass and what can be absorbed as well. So then we have these two kind of principal categories, the two main categories of what are, of what compose or comprise the, the form of the Mass. The ordinary, those parts which do not generally change. And that would involve things obviously like the, 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 all the, the, the dialogues, and uh, some parts which change less than others, so like, for instance, the introductory rites, the, the penitential act, etc. Um, 
And then there are those which are called the prophets, those which change according to the priesthood scene. So obviously you can read it. But also other parts like the entrance antiphon, the collect, um, and the prayer of the gifts, the, the chants between the readings, the offertory chant, which is something we'll come to in, in a bit, and the communion chant. So all those are things that are changeable um, and therefore they require a different form from say the ordinaries and the, 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 the what we call the Kyrie, which is the part of the penitential act or just after the penitential act, the Gloria for Sundays and feast days, um, and sometimes of course the, the creed as well. Those are parts which we are we could call the ordinary. Um, so let's have a look at the parts of the Mass as they are meant to be sung. So sometimes I think we get the impression that it's only those things I mentioned, Kyrie, Gloria, Sanctus, Arnus Dei, which we call the ordinary meant to be sung, but it's not just those parts, it's also other parts as well. So looking at the of the structure of the Mass as the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist, what are the parts of the, of the, of the Mass that, that we would say are meant uh, to be sung? Um, which parts are the, 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 the ordinary and which parts are the proper that are meant to be sung? So those parts which change, for instance, the collect, the readings, the antiphons, those are the parts which change regularly. And then there are those which don't change, the greeting, the dialogues, offer Eucharistic prayer, priest of choice of those which you have. So the ordinary are those parts which do not change very much, or and then the propers which change with the feasts and the scenes. So those are the, the, the two different categories that we're going to be looking at um, principally today, but mainly, the, the propers. <coughs> so um, I want to start looking at the, the category of music um, that, that covers all of this. Um, we call Gregorian chant, which is the main kind of body of chant that belongs specifically to the Roman rite. And there's something very special that Sacrosanctum Vicillium says about Gregorian chant here um, that sacred music, the purpose of it is the glory of God and the sanctification of the faith. So, worship is two things it's both the, it's both the, the giving glory to God, but it's also it's the sanctification of those who take part in it. So, it has a kind of double purpose. Um, the whole of the liturgy does that. And the treasury of sacred music which we've already referred to, to be preserved and cultivated with great care. So it's not just something that is regarded like a museum piece, which I think is sometimes people think that the Gregorian chant is, something which you, you perhaps hear on records, CDs, etc., but not necessarily in the liturgy. One of the things that the, that the, the, the council fathers did want to encourage was the use of Gregorian chant in, in general, and that's one of the things which I'm hoping to try and persuade you to think more um, radically about yet again. It's not just about, about something that's very ancient, Gregorian chant, it's also about something which can be applied now, but we're going to look at that um, as well. So Gregorian chant has what, what Sacristanian Chilling says has first place, all things being equal. It has pride of place. When it says pride of place, it doesn't mean like some kind of museum piece that you look at and admire and then walk away from and say, well, of course, it's lovely, but it doesn't have any practical use for us. It's quite the opposite. It is definitely seen as something which has a practical applicability. It does mention also, Sacrament of Chilean, other kinds of sacred music, especially polyphony, so long as they accord with the spirit of the liturgical action. It's that proviso which is very important, according to the spirit of liturgical action. So certain kinds of music, therefore, are seen already as having a greater affinity with the whole spiritual character of the liturgy. 
and the Gregorian chant is seen as, if you like, the, the, the model of which all others, say the music or the liturgy, is to be understood and to be based on. That's why polyphony is singled out as another example. Though polyphony, of course, is something which is sung by choirs, because obviously the singing parts of the way the word polyphony does mean that. It's, it's many voices singing different parts at the same time. But Gregorian chant is important as being monody. It's, it is always a single line of chant which everybody sings, or those who sing do, do actually sing together at the same time. So it, it's, it's quite distinctively a single line of music. So setting sacred words to a particular single line of, of music. And that is particularly the characteristic of the Roman liturgy. Other liturgical families, like the Byzantines, for instance, have their own form of typical chant. But the Roman form is that which we call the Gregorian chant. And what I'm trying to, to, to convey through the projects that I'm talking about this evening is a form of Gregorian chant that's not simply rooted in the past, but is also very much present in the way that liturgy is celebrated now, or at least that it can and should be much more so than perhaps um, is very often the case in many people's experience now. It's not just simply something for the old rite, or simply something that's for monastic communities. It's something which is, in fact, very much for the benefit of um, ordinary uh, parochial liturgy as well, and can be done. It's not something beyond the grasp of an ordinary parish to do, and that's what I want to try and get across uh, this evening. So let's see what, what else we've got in the Proverbs of the Mass. So these parts which are sung which music is available in the, in the, the Roman rite. Um, the entrance antiphon, which we also call the introit. Um, so that has a specific place which is uh, designed to set the whole scene of, of the liturgy. We'll talk about that in detail as we go on. Then the, the gradual or responsorial psalm, the psalm that comes as a response to the readings. We call it a responsorial psalm, strictly speaking, not just because it has a response built into it, but because it is a response to the word of God. But, and this is the important thing, God has always got the, um, the, um, the, if you like, the first and last word. He has always the initiative. So even when we make response to him, we do so in his own words. So the, the response is itself part of scripture. The response to God's word is God's word, which we ourselves proclaim. Then the acclamation before the gospel, which varies again in structure according to the season, so that normally this would be built around the repetition of the word Alleluia, the Hebrew word Alleluia. But at certain times of the year, particularly of course in Lent, this is omitted and replaced by another sort of chant altogether. And that form of chant is actually interesting because it, it varies again according to, to, um, to, to its, its, its age. The oldest form of chant other than the Alleluia is what we call a tract something that is drawn from a psalm. Again, it's a long chant from a psalm which has no um, uh, response built into it. But nowadays, of course, we tend to use um, acclamations that are built around a, a, repeat, a repeated form of response, such as praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory, that sort of thing. But that's a much more recent uh, kind of chant, uh, not like the, um, the tract that I'm talking about. I'll come on to that. The offertory, there's a chant that's mentioned in the Missal, but interestingly enough, there are no chants 
texts laid down for it in any of the liturgical books. There is, however, um, still a body of chants called the Octories in the Graduale Romani. That's the main body of uh, settings of the texts of these prophets in um, one single volume. The, the Graduale contains not just graduals, but also the settings of the introits, the, the, the acclamations of alleluias, the offertories, and the communions. So all those different proper chants are found in their Gregorian settings, which are the most ancient settings of all, which go right the way back to a time before um, they were written down. There's an oral tradition that is the, the basis of all the, the, these proper chants, as, as indeed also, of course, many of the ordinary chants that we sing as well. It's an oral tradition that precedes what we have written down. Um, so then, coming to, uh, having enumerated them, we come to the, the character of these different proper chants. First of all, their history. As I say, they, they do actually go right way back to an ancient form of chants that would have been familiar even way back to the time of the apostles. So that some of the some of the chants that we find in the graduale would actually have been dated right way back to the time of the apostles and drawn from the tradition that they themselves grew up with, the, the Hebrew tradition of cantillation in the synagogues and of course in the temple too. Um, sometimes specifically there are there are chants which you can relate to uh, those of the, the, the Hebrew tradition. Um, some of the psalm tones for instance that to which the offices are sung and which parts of the prophets also in, incorporate, they also can be traced back uh, quite orderly to Hebrew um, chants. But that's simply to say that that's how far back the tradition goes. But it's obviously been developed over the centuries into forms that, that are much more um, elaborate and quite distinct in their, own, in their own right. But we're not necessarily talking about, about, about trying to introduce the Graduale Romanum in its, in its full form, because that's actually something that is intended to be sung by trained singers. So for instance, the, the, the graduals, that which is given the name to the whole collection of these chants, are very elaborate, um, kind of poly, um, melismatic chants. So, so there's, there's many notes sung to single syllables. They are intended to be sung by trained cantors and choirs. So they're clearly not designed to be sung by congregations. And the same would be true to a lesser extent even of certain other chants in that, that um, collection there. So for instance, the introits are, generally speaking, also elaborate chants designed to be sung by cantors and choirs. Um, but what the council asked for was both a, a, a fully updated version of the ancient chants that were, of course, the preserve of choirs and trained cantors, but also, the, the, the council fathers asked for simpler settings of the liturgical text, the same liturgical text as these, which could be sung also by congregations and by, by cantors and choirs that hadn't got the necessary uh, technical training that was required and is required for some of the more complex chants that you find in the Graduale Romani. So they asked for simpler settings. And there was indeed a collection made um, called the Graduale Simplex, which you can tell from its name means a simple Graduale, which is indeed much simpler to sing, but it doesn't in fact include all of the texts that we've got here. It only includes representative texts of certain uh, kinds of a, of, a, of a generic kind, rather than the actual texts associated with each of these days. So as each of these, these texts that you've got here is distinctive for every <coughs> particular Sunday and feast day throughout the year. Um, the Graduale Simplex provided 
just um, a kind of representative group for each particular season, rather than those which belong specifically to each of the days. Um, so the Graduale Romanum contains distinctive individual settings of all of these texts for every Sunday and feast day. And of course, certain uh, kind of categories like the commons of um, pastors, martyrs, apostles, etc. But generally speaking, we're talking about a large body of distinctive charts. So, given the fact that you've got something that is actually, historically speaking, quite demanding in form, with all those different charts that have, I mentioned that you find in the Graduale Romano, when the, the, the Missal uh, says, at this point, you sing a setting of this text. The Missal also says, however, if you can't sing that, you can sing something else. And it gives the order, first of all, in preference, that which is found in the Graduale Romano, but then also the Graduale Simplex chant so that if you want to, you can sing something like that, which also means that not just a choir, but also a congregation can sing. But failing that, there's also the possibility that you can sing a hymn or some other text approved by the bishop's conference. And that, of course, generally means substitute songs and hymns. So what we generally happen to have, from what we've already mentioned, of course, is what we call the hymn sandwich, or at least the substitute hymn or song. So that at the beginning of Mass, instead of singing the introit, you would have a, a metrical hymn. Now the problem with, with the substitute um, texts, this, this was something that largely arose in the 19th century, um, not in the Catholic world, because in the Catholic world, when they were singing at Mass, it would always be of the proper texts. So in fact, various kind of um, uh, ways of dealing with these, these texts were devised. Sometimes just sing, simply singing the text to a monotone, sometimes to a psalm tone, and there were some simpler settings of various kinds that were devised as well. But by and large, from the Anglican tradition, they grew up in the later 19th century the custom of singing metrical hymns at this point. Though interestingly enough, most metrical hymns that we're used to singing and we also hear in Anglican services were not, to, were not originally devised for, the, for being sung during the Eucharistic liturgy at all. They were devised for other devotional purposes entirely. That's, that's another matter altogether. But, it's important to remember that the, the sort of things that we're used to seeing in Mass, and we think of as standard repertoire, were not really designed to be sung at Mass at all. I mean, just simply straight off, off um, the top of my head, for instance, a very common um, hymn to sing at the beginning of any service of grand occasion would be, say, Cardinal Newman's Praise the Holiest in the Height. Well, Cardinal Newman wrote those words, of course, as part of his longer poem, The Dream of Gerontius. It was not in any way designed, least of all by him, to be sung during the course of the Mass. And is not particularly adapted for that purpose, though it's very often used in that way, as indeed many other metrical hymns are as well, because we've become used to it. And I think that the, what we've become used to has in many ways rather skewed our whole understanding of what liturgical singing is really about. Um, an, an image that I, I, I like to, to use, in fact, I hope it doesn't seem too, um, too, too cynical or irreverent, is that it's a bit like in the 19th century, many uh, gardeners um, in, in, in this country introduced various uh, exotic plants from around the world to try and pep up their, 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 their gardens. And one of those things, for instance, which became very popular was Japanese knotweed. Well, Japanese knotweed, of course, 
having been a very exotic you know, introduction, has become a terrible nuisance. And it's very hard to eradicate it. <laughs> and I rather think that, that the danger that we were in with liturgical music is that many of the things that have been introduced as substitutes for want of anything better have now become the norm. And in fact, it's, it takes a, a kind of, kind of, you know, a, a kind of, um, you know, paradigm shift to to get away from the idea of singing hymns at mass, which don't really belong there at all, to singing the proper texts, which actually have a great deal more spiritual appropriateness and richness to give us. We've largely ignored them, in fact, over the last few years. But one of the reasons, of course, for, for having alternative texts, as I say, is because the actual liturgical texts are set to forms of music that are very often considered either too um, alien now, because they're unfamiliar to, to many people, as Gregorian chants tend to be, or because they are just so difficult, or at least they're perceived as too difficult, and therefore they're dismissed as being uh, impractical. As I say earlier on about what the council said about Gregorian chants having pride of place, very often people treat that as saying, saying oh yes, it's, it's all very beautiful, and we can listen to it on CDs and we can we can admire it, but it's not really very practical for the liturgy itself. And yet, of course, that's precisely what it was not just designed for, but that is precisely the, the, the whole both musical and spiritual ambience that formed it in the first place for the liturgy. It arose within and for the liturgy, and not as something that was dreamt out in somebody's imagination. And somebody else said, oh, that would be quite good to have in the liturgy. It actually rose from within the liturgy itself. As I say, it's not just a question of what fathers and trained cantors can do. One of the things that the, that the fathers of the Second Vatican Council wanted to encourage was something that was not new to them, not new to the 1960s, but actually goes a much, much further back than this whole idea of um, what we call active participation. But active participation is not only about doing things, it's really to do with a positive sense of engagement in the whole action of the liturgy. So it's not just simply about somebody singing or speaking or acting in some particular physical way, it's all about being absorbed into the whole ethos of the liturgy and having a kind of positive engagement with all that's going on. And that's what the whole concept of active participation was intended to, to be, right from the time that the idea was first kind of promoted with any great kind of vigor by um, Pope Pius X. So this is going way back over 100 years ago. And that idea grew gradually throughout the 20th century as something that was a great desideratum. So that liturgy wasn't just something that people went to and somebody got on with while everybody else got on with just simply saying their prayers. It was the idea that, that those who were attending were actually actively engaged in the whole process of what was going on not just simply by being physically present, nor necessarily only by what they said and did themselves, but by being consciously and, and, um, and spiritually engaged by everything that, that was going on. That they were part of it, not just simply spectators at it. And one of the ways in which that can be encouraged, of course, is by giving people, something that they are able to sing themselves as well. And so the idea of active participation did also involve, as I say, the Second Vatican Council fathers saying, it is a good idea if there could be provided forms of chance that people themselves could sing as well. 
So not just those which choirs can sing, but those which the people themselves can be encouraged to sing and they'll be able to sing too. So therefore, we're talking about all sorts of different categories of people who can be involved in singing the Mass. And this is what the projects that I've been working on called the Graduale Pardon is all about. Pardon, of course, being the word for little. So it's it's a kind of, it's distinct from the Graduale Romanum, which of course is the great ancient body of, te of text set to music, gradual, the, 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 the Gregorian chant, and it's distinct from the Graduale Simplex, which I say is that kind of cut down version of just a few generic texts for, for each category. It's a setting of all of the important individual sets, uh, texts of the liturgy, the main sort of Sundays and feast days of the year, but which can be sung by cantors and choirs, cantors and congregations, or choirs and congregations. I'm going to give you an, an actual example of, of how it works in just a short time. And not just, of course, um, <coughs> liturgy in, uh, in the vernacular, but also in Latin as well. And not just in Latin, but also in vernacular, whichever way you want to look at it first of all. So taking the Graduale Parvum, I brought along with me the, the first part of the Graduale Parvum, which has been published, which is the Book of Introits. But it's a project, I say, is ongoing. Um, and so the Introits, the Entrance Antiphons, I'll give you an example of, of that in, in a little, little while. But just to explain what else there is, apart from the introits, there's the communion antiphons, which are about to be published as well. They're actually in, in the process of being prepared for publication now. Um, and then others which are also coming through the, the pipeline, which are already in draft form, are set in some graduals, the alleluias, and the tracks. So those are, those are the chants that go around the, the liturgy of the word. And then finally, the offertory chant, which I mentioned before, which still is mentioned in the Missal, but you only find it in the Graduale Romano at the moment, the settings of those. So that's another thing which, if we've got time, we might come on to it, but I, I'll, I'll leave that for long, for, on the long thing or whatever. For, for, for later, if there's time. But I'm more interested, really, in trying to, to evade the whole idea of the gradual problem, particularly through the entrance antiphon, uh, to start with, at least. Um, now, what I've done here, I think, I, I'm going to try and... Ah, oh, yes, I want to try and um, look through this, this way. Um, what I want to do here is to is to give you an idea of of what the the introits of the graduate part were actually like, using as an example the introit for next Sunday for Corpus Christi, just just as a starter, and and in the first instance the the English setting of the introit. Um, so instead of, of beginning Mass with, say, something like singing um, O Bread of Heaven or, or some other Eucharistic hymn, I want you to think that this is the way to, to begin um, the Mass. Psalm 80. And obviously at a low mass you might hear that read out. At a sun mass you might be singing him instead. But what the graduale parvum provides you with is a setting of 
the text which can be sung to mark the entire opening of the Mass. And it provides um, a, a wonderful way of entering into the Mass. And the, the, the entrance antiphon described in the, in the instruction, general instruction, as a chant which gathers everybody together in the beginning and launches the entire action of the liturgy in such a way that prepares everyone spiritually for what is yet to come and unites them into a single body. And that, of course, is, you could say, that any kind of um, entrance chant will do that. A hymn can do that too. But the actual text of the liturgy, the introit, is perfectly suited to that because it's a scriptural text for start rather than a humanly composed one. And the way it works is that if you want to, you can sing just that as the celebrant comes in and then begin the mass straight away. Or if there's a long procession, you can extend it. Because one of the things that the, the, the entrance antiphon is provided with in the graduale Romanum tradition is the interleaving, if you like, of different verses, usually from the same psalm, as in this case here. So you can sing verses of the psalm between repetitions of the antiphon. And the more, of course, having a, a, the, the, the idea of having a, 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 an antiphon to repeat is that it means that, that, that a choir can sing that. And the congregation is encouraged to pick that up as well. Or indeed, just a cantor on his own with the congregation, but again, encouraging the congregation to join in. In the meantime, between the repetitions of the antiphon, the cantor or the choir can sing the verses of the psalm. But that would, the verse of the psalm would be for, if you like, for those who are set apart to do it, the cantor or the choir. The antiphon is for the whole congregation to sing, which of course wouldn't be possible with the graduale Romanum setting because it's a much more complex chant. But these are proper Gregorian chants. These aren't kind of invented chants. They are based on Gregorian melodies, um, which some of which are, you, you, I, I dare say, you might already recognize. You might indeed recognize this one too. It depends on how much Gregorian music you already know. But you can see it's not a very difficult chant to learn. As I say, the thing about, about, about singing the introit at this, in this way as well is that you can extend it for exactly the amount of time that you need. With a, a metrical hymn, taking the example, as I mentioned before, of praise to the holiest in the high, for instance, you've got um, all seven verses of that. And it takes as long as it takes to sing, regardless of what's going on in the sanctuary. Well, so very often what you will find, of course, is that when you're singing an entrance hymn, the celebrant will be standing and waiting to start the mass long before the hymn's actually finished. Whereas if you're singing an, 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 an introit, you can make it as long or as short as you need to by singing as many different verses of the psalm as you need. You don't have to sing them all. You just sing as many as you need for the, for the, for the processional and entrance rites as there are. So for instance, if you've got a, a long procession for a very solemn day, when you go all the way around the church, you might need extra verses with the repetitions of the psalm for the antiphon. And if you've got the incensation of the altar, Again, as on a solemn feast on the Sunday, you'll probably need more setting, more, more psalm verses between the antiphon. But you don't have to have them all. You have as many as you need. And when the celebrant has finished whatever he's doing before he goes on with the sign of the cross, you just stop at that point there. So <coughs> let's just pick up the, the intro from where we were. With the verse. Sing joyfully to God our strength. Singing to a song tone, of course. Shout in triumph to the God of Jacob. Back to the antiphon. He fed them with the finest meat, and satisfied them with honey from the Do we have another? 
other and other birds. But of course, with this example, with the way we actually set set up the recordings, we only sang one verse, so as not to to overload the CD that we made, because there's quite a lot of different CDs. There's four CDs containing all the introits, which I got over there. If anyone is interested, the same. Like you see, there are different ones. Now, this Drinking is water before bed. As they sleep, by adding this one ingredient to their glass. That's that's a that's a wonderful <laughs> liturgical. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the the, the bathos of destroying the, the atmosphere of a liturgy. Yeah. <laughs> now, I've done that already. Oh, so, well, oh, sorry. Who are we? Is this the? No, that's, that's the one. So you, then there's also the um, the same thing in Latin. <coughs> The idea that I've, I've tried to do is to make sure that there are corresponding texts in both, in both languages, so that you can choose one or the other. And it's generally the same melody, but also adapted slightly to the different genius of the, of the two languages. because the alleluias are exactly the same. And the song tone is the same, but I'm using different words. To show you, is I oh, mentioned you several so various times. Yeah. <laughs> you must see this. Here we go again. The award winning doctor reveals an astonishing natural. Uh, rather, rather, rather embarrassing. Sorry? Yeah. There we are. Okay. So I want to get back to, to this and. Um, Show you the, the 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 other the other chance. So I mentioned that um, the, the chance between the readings are in a draft form. So here is, for instance, the the, the gradual for Corpus Christi. 
the, um, which is the, the most ancient form of the chant that follows the, the first reading. Um, and because the gradual <coughs> only exists officially in Latin, it's only got a, a Latin setting in this form. Um, I just want to, to, to show you what this looks like. Um, and I can, I can sing, there isn't a recording of this, so in fact all I can do here is, is sing it for you. So you get an idea of what the, the, the melody is like. So this is a different melody this time, it's a seventh mode melody rather than the, the eighth mode melody that you heard in the, the intro. They're all different modes, and I can say more about that another time. There's rather more than, it's like different keys in, in, um, in, in more modern music. So they have a slightly different sort of character. So the seventh mode is, is, is slightly different from, from the, the eighth. Ocoli omnium, in te sperons domine, et udas helis helscam, in tempore opportuno. Aperis tu manum tuam, et in preso me animal benedictionum. Then you repeat. Oculi omnium in te sperant domine, et uras illis escam in tempore opportuno. So that's just given in Latin because that's the only form that officially exists. There isn't an English form. <coughs> so obviously that wouldn't necessarily be, be, be used um, in every liturgy, but it's available there. Then the Alleluia. Now the thing about the Alleluia, which is an interesting phenomenon, is that in the Latin um, tradition, the, the final syllable of the Alleluia is very extended in what's called a jubilus. Um, now this is a very ancient tradition. St. Augustine talks about this. This is one of the readings in the Oxford readings, which mentions this quite specifically. Um, so um, it's well worthwhile looking out for that. It comes up in Easter tide, uh, singing the, 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 the final solo of the Alleluia. And these can be very elaborate chants in the, in the tradition. We're used, of course, to singing um, an antiphon very often. So, so for instance, the antiphon from the Easter Vigil, Alleluia, 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 which is a, um, a psalm antiphon. Uh, from, as I say, from the Easter Vigil originally, which has now become very widespread. What I've given here is something that is much more according to the tradition of the Jubilus. So the final syllable is given much, many more notes. But in order to make it possible for that to be sung by a congregation, what I've used is different melodies which are much more familiar um, than would otherwise be the case with, with a more complex chant. So that might look like an awful lot of notes there, but I think that probably many people will recognize the melody if I sing it now. Alleluia. Does anybody recognize that melody at all? That's right, it's the little Veni Creato. So, it's just the beginning and the end of the Ven Creator. And then the verse, you recognize that also uses the same melody. The, the structure of the, um, the ancient Roman Alleluia more effectively than perhaps um, most modern settings do, but it's also quite singable um, by um, a count or a bar. And what I've, I've tried to do is to use different melodies like those, which are already quite familiar and can be generally um, 
the, the knowledge of them can be easily transferred to to a different uh, chart. So that's that's the the, the gradual alleluia for Corpus Christi. Um, I think I've just sent, wiped something out there. And the, the communion, the communions work in the same sort of way. Um, if I can get onto the right page. So you can see there's quite a lot of them. This is just to show that, that they all do exist. I'm not just, uh, I'm not just, not just showing you a few pretend ones. And then to show you also that the, the same melodies keep on turning up. Here's the eighth mode again. We have the eighth mode for, for um, uh, the introit of um, Corpus Christi. This is the communion antiphon for Pentecost. Um, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So again, this is both in in, in Latin and in English. So, Repetisum tom spiritu sanctum, Nocente maniae ad dei alleluia. So that's, um, the, the communion antiphon's generally much shorter than the, the introits, and then the English version of that. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And spoke of the marvels of God. Alleluia. And again, the same thing happens here. The, the verses of the psalm are sung in between the repetitions of the antiphon. The thing about the introits and the communions is that they're both what we call pro processional chants. So the, the, they're both sung during some other action that's going on. Um, and as the introit, it covers the action of the entrance of the sacred ministers and the incensation of the altar, for instance. So the communion antiphon covers the procession of the congregation to receive Holy Communion. And again, the, the, the idea is that the, the antiphon is something which can be easily picked up and repeated by the congregation without needing a textbook, so that as they're going up to communion, this can be sung. It's, of course, it's intended to be sung this way. That's what the, the instruction in the Missal quite clearly lays down, that the antiphon is intended to be sung during the distribution of Holy Communion. So this is something which, again, you, just, you wouldn't just simply sing it once through and stop. You sing it with the verses of the psalm in between, after the intro, and then repeat the antiphon at the end. So, going on then to Corpus Christi, since that's what we've been looking at already. So there's, there's Trinity, Pentecost, and now Corpus Christi. Oh, wait a minute. I think I've got, I've got it in the right place. Here we are. So, the, first of all, the, the Latin um, setting, we man to cut carne me. Oh, this, this is a sixth mode, so let's take it a little bit lower. We man to cut carne me. E bibit sanguine me. In me man. Te te go in e go. Dicit dominus. Okay, so that's the sixth mode melody. And then putting that into English, um, if I can find that. Here we are. Okay, so what if I can make this a bit bigger? Okay, so how about having a having a go at singing this? <coughs> All right, um, and I'll sing the verses in between as well. So, so I'll intone the first time round. It's the same melodies I've just seen in the Latin, so you can pick it up fairly straightforwardly, I think. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him, says the Lord. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. 
celebration to Im imprint itself more effectively upon us spiritually. So those, those are all the different chants then that you've heard for, for Corpus Christi, the, the entrance chant from the gradual alleluia and the communion chant. So those are the ones that, that would be uh, for the next Sunday. Um, now, as I say, the, the idea of course is that Chants like this can be sung in a variety of different ways. They can be sung by, um, by a soloist, by a choir, or by, or by a soloist and a choir, or by a cantor and a congregation, or a choir and a congregation. So there are many different ways in which they can be sung. So they're, they're quite adaptable. And obviously, again, they can be adapted according to the occasion. So if you've got a long uh, communion, and of course you've got plenty of verses to sing, as you can see here. So what, you've got as many as nine verses, all that, with the, cant of the, the, the repetition of the anthem in between. So that means that there's plenty of, of, um, of, of, of material there, if you like, to, to sing, to, to keep occupied during the, the, the action of communion. So what I've been, been trying to, to, to suggest in presenting this to you is a different way of looking at liturgical music and a different way of singing in the liturgy. So it's not just singing that's kind of plonked in to the liturgy, it's actually something which arises organically from liturgy and as, as Sacrosan Virgilium put it, integral to the celebration of liturgy rather than something that's just simply been added onto it something which arises from it and expresses the spirit of the liturgy um, more effectively, but which can also be sung by a congregation without too much um, difficulty in everything. So many of these melodies you will find will be repeated over the course of a year. Because there are, there are, there are eight modes, eight different sort of keys, and there are probably no more than two different melodies in each of those modes, some of them only one. So that's, there would be around about a dozen melodies at the very most which you would hear during the course of years. So there's enough variety so it doesn't get too boring, but also there's enough kind of common ground for there not to have to be too many different melodies to, to learn over and over again. So that's just a brief introduction. As you can see, we've, we've actually taken up, well, I've taken up all that time. But perhaps the extra five minutes will be accounted for by the adverts that we weren't <laughs> expecting to see. So, anyway, any, does anybody um, want to ask any, any questions at all at this stage? Yes, my name? I'll be brave. <laughs> 